So welcome everyone who have already joined. Um, welcome to the event, the Practical Road to Innovation. And as you already know, uh, your star tonight will be Leah, our product lead from Small PDF. Uh, I'm Eva, and I'm an employee branding specialist. And as you probably know, uh, in Small PDF, we build simple yet powerful document solution for people to do business better. So it's all about people and how to make their daily routines and daily lives better and that is why we are constantly growing improving listening to their experience and adjusting to uh, fit their expectations but this is leah's topic and she's an expert in this field so i won't steal her spotlight she will take it from here and i will be here to support her and you during the whole webinar so to keep everything smooth uh, i will just ask you to keep your microphones off and uh, you will you're able to write comments in the chat and you can ask questions in q a section and after the Leah's presentation is over we will address all the questions that you might have so she will take it from here and enjoy and have fun good morning everyone my name is leah thank you very much for this fantastic introduction eva so as you've already said, you can post questions and, and, and stuff into the chat. Um, so before we start, um, I have to admit, this is one of my riskiest presentations because it's completely different to anything that I've ever done. Um, based on two factors. First of all, it's not very well prepared because I had to put together the slides literally like 10 minutes before I actually um, got done here. And um, I wanted to do something a little bit different. Instead of just like repeating what other people say all the time, I try to really put things together that are usable. And that's also why I call it the practical road to innovation. Um, and there should be things that you can actually take home from this, regardless of whether you are speaking from a leadership position in a company, um, whether you want to learn something as a product manager yourself, as a product designer, or you just want to be innovative in your life for whatever reason. Um, that would be so yes so the title for this one is the practical road to innovation it has about to do with innovation and how to actually practically apply it in your business life or in your private life so to myself um this is me my name is Leah Dara. um i have been in ux research and engineering for about 10 years at the start of my life i mean not at the very start but you know as i started to enter my professional part and then for another 12 years until now, I have been a uh, product manager, still am, and uh, I'm leading the core experience of small PDF. So just for those who, who don't know, we are small PDF. We make PDFs easy. We make actually money with the fact that PDFs are very hard to manage and actually handle. And um, yeah, we're providing all the tools that you need to be more productive and work smarter with documents, essentially. We have 70 million monthly active users. We are a SaaS B2C business. Um, we're focusing on the SMB market um, and we are around 100 employees, maybe even more right now. I don't even know. Maybe my presentation is already outdated in this regard. And we have people in Zurich, Belgrade and um, Barcelona. We're also in the top 200 most visited websites. Now that doesn't mean a lot in terms of what the product is and how innovative we are, but um, that's who I am and that's what the company is. Yes, so we're 120 and growing. There you go. So here's the agenda. Here's what I want to talk about today. And uh, we'll see how long that goes because I also didn't time this, uh, this presentation. So it could be that we're sitting here for like four hours. I hope not. So the first thing that I want to talk about is innovation and naked men. Um, the practical ingredients when it comes to innovation itself. Creativity, storytelling, cognition and memory. All these things are important when we talk about innovation. And then some more nitty gritty things about actual processes that you can actually use in your um, daily life or in your company and so forth. Um, there's two things that we talk about there. One of them is the culture in the company itself, cross-functional teams, and actually three things. Um, the last slides that I added is a product-led model versus a sales-led model and what that actually means. So let's go to the fun stuff. What is innovation? What are we actually talking about? If you, like me, every morning read through the ISO uh, sort of, uh, the ISO standards, specifically 56,020, as we all do, um, the definition very dryly formulated is a new or changed entity realizing or redistributing value. Doesn't mean quite that much. I find it also quite boring. So let's use some, uh, some quotes from other people to actually explain this. And before I go into this, there's an actual study on the definition of innovation and what it actually could mean. So that study only concerns itself with what 
what you actually mean with innovation. And then there's also some tables with like justifications, why it should mean this and that based on that other study and that other justification. It's quite interesting. So what is innovation? Let's try it again. Let's try it with some actual quotes that are a bit more inspiring. Let's put it that way. So creativity is thinking up new things and innovation is doing new things. This is a quote from Theodore Leavitt. He was a renowned economist. Nobody knows him, but um, pretty good quote. Another one is innovation is progress in the face of tradition. And this one is quite fitting as well, because tradition is by definition what we always used to do. We're doing it because we used to do it. And innovation is changing tradition, thinking outside of the box, thinking outside of the things that we used to do. And this one here is also one that I really love because it applies to the professional setting that we have quite often. So innovation, if you think about any new idea by definition, will not be accepted at first. It takes repeated attempts, endless demonstrations, monotonous rehearsals before innovation can be accepted and internalized by an organization. This requires courageous patience. Now, this is very true if you think about it, right? So like if you have an innovative idea, something that you really want to do and nobody really believes in it, you need to go through all these processes. If this wouldn't be the case, then it would already probably be realized and then it would not be innovative anymore, right? So like being innovative is hard by definition because if it was easy, then it was not very innovative. So let's talk about the process of innovation. And um, every self-respecting person who has a presentation obviously has a process graph. And I also designed one, as you can see here. Thank you very much. So <laughs> we think, or like I think about innovation in the sense that it is about three things. The first part is to surface ideas, um, which we do with creativity. The second part is about communicating ideas, which we do with storytelling. And the third part is iterating on solutions and for that we need to understand what is being said through cognition and also remember what has been said over a longer process through memory and then we start the entire thing again and so forth and so forth and now if you have wondered at the start of the presentation why i mentioned naked men um then this is the solution basically this is a picture of archimedes exclaiming eureka and in his excitement he forgets to dress and <laughs> runs nude in the street straight out of his bath now, I don't know whether this is true. It's quite funny, in my opinion. Um, so basically, if you uh, want to be innovative, you just have to be naked and just run through the streets, whatever. I, I think this is also like an exclamation of, you know, how a process of innovation can go. Um, now, going back into more serious territory, let's talk about creativity. And when we're talking about creativity, let's do the same exercise. What do we actually mean with creativity? If you remember the quote from before, what it like that creativity is at the beginning of every innovation, and let's say we agree on this. So creativity is defined as the tendency to generate or recognize ideas, alternatives, or possibilities that may be useful in solving problems, communicating with others, and entertaining ourselves and others. It's probably the most generalistic definition that I could actually find of it. I think we all know what we mean when we talk about creativity. But did you know that you can actually measure it? Measuring creativity or formalizing what is creative is quite a good tool if you want to optimize this process that I showed you before about being innovative. There are studies on this subject. One of them is from Guilford, JP, uh, 1959, and the personality, the nature of human intelligence. And one factor that we have when we talk about creativity is the number of ideas. The more ideas you have, the better, right? The more creative something is. The second factor that you have is the flexibility of these ideas. How diverse are these ideas? That's the second factor. Pretty obvious so far. The third one is the originality. How novel is the idea? And that always depends on the context of when you're trying to generate an idea. So for instance, if I was traveling back in time 200 years and I was coming up with the concept of an electric car, it would be a pretty novel idea. Today, not so much, right? So how novel something is, is determined by the context of when an idea is generated and also like from our kind of starting point. And then the fourth factor is elaboration, which basically means how close to a mental model an idea can be formalized, which means in other words, if I have an idea in my head, 
how close can I actually tell it to someone? And they also understand it that way. These four factors are determining in the end how creative your process is or your group or your company or whatever you do. And there is a correlation between fluency and the other factors. What that means is the more ideas that you create, the more your flexibility and originality will go up. Obviously, it will never go down. You may be on the same level, right? If you just duplicate the same ideas. But the more ideas you create, the more diverse and novel they will be by definition. So here's a question to the group. You don't have to answer it. Just answer it in your head. Um, when we're brainstorming, how do we tend to generate the best and most innovative ideas? Do we do this in a group, simultaneous at the same time? Or do we do this better individually and everybody for themselves? For me, this was quite a new concept because individuals actually generate ideas on their own that are better than brainstorming groups. For me, this was novel. This was quite new. So this, you know, I wanted to know why. It goes further. You should always ideate alone, spread during the day. That is the optimal process. I know you cannot always do this, but like have people ideate on things individually in their own time, spread during the day, tell them what they should sort of um, think about, and then you go together in the group and you compare. But why? Why is this the case? There's a lot of studies that actually support this. I'm not just like making this up. Um, so why is brainstorming in a group wrong? There are a couple of factors. One of them is called social loafing. Alone, we work harder because we cannot rely on what others are doing. Makes sense. If I'm on a stage and I'm dancing alone, <laughs> I have to perform a little bit better than if I'm in an ensemble of like 30 people. Another one is called production blocking. Due to the chaos of someone interrupting you, for instance, you might lose a train of thought, right? So we are in a group of five people, everybody's talking and I'm trying to form an idea and I'm getting it ready to actually write and then someone else is talking and it's actually distracting me. There's a thing called group conformity in which early ideas shape future ideas. So if you're starting to brainstorm in a group and the very first idea is about a flying pink pig, you can almost bet money on it that most of the ideas are following will be influenced by that particular idea. Either it will be more pink stuff, more pigs, more flying things, whatever it is. This is called group conformity, also a proven effect. Downward norm setting, performance of a group is determined usually by its weakest contributor. So someone that is really weak in a group and is just not contributing, they also drag down sort of the performance of the entire group. And now this one here is quite interesting. There's a, call, there's a thing called the illusion of group productivity. Usually you have a higher satisfaction with lower performance in a group. Why? Because the cognitive, the cognitive failures are less noticeable in a group, raising the perception of the results of your own performance. What does that mean? If I were alone, and I'm ideating on something, like I'm trying to figure out a really incredibly difficult business case, or I'm trying to think of a solution for a very difficult problem. If I'm getting stuck, I will notice that. I will remember this moment of getting stuck, that I cannot go further, that I need a coffee, that I need to maybe walk around or like talk to someone else to actually get to a better solution. In a group you have by definition less of these moments because the group is sort of pulling forward. And that can create the illusion of higher group productivity when you actually would be more performant in an, in an individual setting, even if you get stuck. Because the diversity of ideas, because of the downward norm setting, because of the group conformity, everything else that I actually mentioned from before. There's a big illusion thinking that groups are actually more productive in thinking of and collaborating around ideas um, when you're thinking about creating them. It's just not the case. And this is the reason for it. So again, idea it alone, you compare in a group. It's a proven effect. There's a study at the, um, at the bottom as well. It's called productivity loss in brainstorming groups and meta-analytic integration. It's a very well um, documented thing. 
So I hope that was already useful, right? So this is one practical advice to you all um, in the sense that on, on how you should um, brainstorm ideas if you, any, if you have any of these processes. So the second part is about storytelling. So let's say we have these ideas, right? So like we brainstormed ideas or we had user interviews, we talked to customers, we're trying, we're starting to understand what their things are. Now we need to communicate these ideas, either by writing them down, by communicating tomorrow to our uh, other teams, and we have to communicate, right? So we have to formalize any of this stuff. And this is where storytelling comes in and why it is so incredibly important. If creativity is how we surface ideas, then storytelling is how we communicate these ideas. So let me tell you a story. In 2022, I started to write articles. I'm pretty confident in my presentation skills and I really love presenting things, you know, like the current presentation that I'm doing right now. But I also wanted to write. I really thought that, you know, this is going to be easy. And I was on a roll, right? I started to write articles. I started to write a lot of articles and I loved writing them. They were pretty amazing, right? <laughs> but as you can see in this um, font across the entire screen that is coming out too early, um, I wasn't very happy with it. And one of the reasons is, is that I'm not very good at storytelling when it actually comes to written articles. At least I'm not very happy about it. So what I started to do is I tried to think of, hmm, maybe I can read about things on how to write stories better because all the stuff that I'm writing is based on the context of jobs, right? And product management and how to make better products and all that, that kind of stuff. So I started to write a book and not write, sorry. Like I started to read a book called Wired for Story. And I also read some articles on this kind of stuff. Me not knowing a lot about storytelling in a written form. And one of the questions that really drove me was like, what makes a story compelling? And this is also like, if you're communicating an idea, in essence, you are, you are communicating a story. What makes a story memorable? How can we actually remember the stuff that we're talking about? How can we make it significant? Especially the things that are important, but not often mentioned. And here's what I learned. And I'm not sure whether the next couple of slides will make sense, but I really hope so. But this is the stuff that I actually learned from reading that particular book and then also trying to um, apply it into reality. If we're thinking about storytelling, you really cannot change how someone thinks about something without first changing how they feel about it. And I'm going to get into this, why this is so important in a second. We also do not turn to story to escape reality. We turn to story and stories to navigate reality. If you hear something, you can relate to it and then you can also feel it, right? And then you can actually, you can relate to things and then we can actually put something into action to combat these things. Because story translates big ideas and abstract concepts into very specific scenarios, allowing us to personally experience the consequences of these facts through the one biological system by which we make every decision we ever make. And that are our emotions. Now you're all muted and it's possible that some of you say, hey, but Leah, I don't make emotional decisions. I also make rational decisions. The thing is, even if you rationally evaluate facts about stuff, in the end, you decide based on how they make you feel. If you're starting to analyze quantitative data, qualitative data, even if you reach just the driest topic on the world on the stock market, <laughs> which makes me cry as well at the moment because it's just so down, which is also an emotion, it still makes you feel something. You feel confident or you feel insecure about it or you feel like there's not enough substantiation to it or there is enough about it. There are stories about people who have lost the part of the brain that allows them to feel specific emotions. And these people tend to have problems to make decisions, even though they still have the rational side of their brain fully functional. I'm linking in one of the, um, in the appendix, one really interesting YouTube video, or like also one of the books. It's also one part of the story from Lisa Cron, um, where this is a little bit more elaborate. For the moment, you just have to believe me that this is the case. 
And if you want to have a proof that this is actually the case, what I just said, no matter how logical and rational we actually try to evaluate the world, you can turn to marketing. Marketing does not just give you numbers and facts. Marketing that works, that drives us to do things, that it makes us understand problems is emotional. It makes us understand and relate on an individual level what is going on in a problem with something. You can read about the war in the Ukraine, for instance, or like how many people that died or whatever. But if you see specific videos of things of individuals going through really terrible things, this might be the thing that actually moves you to donate your money, right? And this is the case for pretty much anything in marketing. And this is a measurable effect because if it wouldn't work, then they wouldn't do it, of course, right? This is how we also understand and try to sell products because we can relate on an individual level what we are using and what they are experiencing as a problem. So what does that mean in a practical sense? We're focusing on problems of individuals to understand big opportunities. You can explain to someone all day long how many electric cars have been sold in the last two years. But describing to someone how you feel when you get into the car as an individual, when you're driving, the cool features that you can do is still a different experience. And this is something that makes people feel something. It might not convince you in the end. I'll give you that. And data might still be important in the end to drive rational decisions, sure. But at the beginning of everything, there is an emotion. Show and do not tell. People are not buying your products. They're buying better versions of themselves. Nobody gets a Coke because it's a Coke. They're getting it because they're thirsty and they want something to steal their thirst. Stories unite us and then act as a common thread to ensure that the right thing is being built throughout the entire product development. If I understand there's a specific solution and it can be a really dry product. And to be honest, I mean, we're building a pretty dry product, right? So we're like, we're dealing with documents and PDF documents and, and um, Word and PowerPoints and so forth understanding what the struggle is of people because they can get really annoyed you know like during their day like i'm losing a document or like the file is too big i cannot i cannot submit my thesis to to the university server because the file is too big i need i need someone to make my file smaller so i can actually submit my phd thesis that i worked on for three months otherwise i'm not gonna get through the process these are real problems and the solutions that we have are not that important it's really about the problems and understanding them because then you can build solutions that are worth buying for any customer because they have a meaningful impact in their life. So what does that mean? Now to the more boring stuff, right? So in the sense of like, what does that mean for a company? For research and strategy, this means that data and analytics tells you what is happening, but listening to the users helps you understand why they're doing things. If I'm looking at a big set of data um, in my website, there's no way that I can say why someone is doing certain things. It's just impossible. I can look at specific functions, but that still does not tell me why people are doing things. I have to go down to the individual's level and do user interviews. I need to understand why they're doing things that they're doing. And for design and UX, things are, for instance, story mapping, right? So you're trying to answer the how, the where, and when are people doing things to actually solve their problems. So you're thinking through the experience as a story creates a system for making decisions about design and timing. And in terms of development, QA and releasing, which is the entire cycle now, right? So we have research, design, and then we are developing it. And quality assurance also, it helps to understand intimately what the purpose of a feature is to figure out whether it's working as intended. Imagine we're developing a feature where you can share a file um, to someone else. And someone has to test this. There's a big difference between a, fit, a, a ticket that says user clicks on button and then they can do this and then they can enter email address and then they send it off. And just describing what the buttons sort of functionally do, right? So this is clickable, that is clickable, and then you send it off here. Describing it from the user's perspective, the entire flow, user is, um, developing a document and at the end of their process, they want to share it with someone else. So they use the function, they click on it, they enter and search probably the email address. So they copy paste it from somewhere else. 
they put it in or they use also the uh, the address book that we have integrated and then they send it to them that would be the best version of this right so you're trying to flip the entire context into this which makes it easier to test and practical storytelling whether you believe it or not this is a kind of description of how you would describe any story um like in the sense of star wars lord of the rings most of the stories are following this um, kind of thing. And the same is actually happening for the customers. You're being exposed to something, <laughs> something is happening, an, an incident, the, the, the action is rising, there's a specific crisis, and then there's a climax, right? Something, I need to have a solution, something needs to happen, and then I find the solution, and the denouement is actually happening, so the falling action, and then I'm successful in the end. That is the story that we're also doing, and we are actually entering somewhere on the crisis Point, right so we're like we're trying to offer and give them the sword to attack the problem and i hope that was practical enough but really do not underestimate the power of story so whenever you're describing something also try to involve the individual level of someone because that is how we relate to things now let's go to the last part um, when we're talking about innovation in terms of iterating on solutions and also a thing that personally quite interests me when it comes to cognition and memory. So how do we actually retain things? Because if you cannot do any, either of those two things, everything that was before is also quite useless. So let's talk about it. In order to communicate with, uh, in order to communicate ideas with storytelling effectively, it is important that we are able to retain and recall the most important information. Cognition in this regard is the ability to understand things. And memory is the underlying mechanism to remember and recall all of that. Not a big surprise to anyone in the call, I'm pretty sure. But why does memory matter? And why do we actually need to understand it in this context? Let's say you want to remember relevant concepts from a book. I have a very common thing that when I'm actually reading about books or like I'm consuming books and I'm taking notes, to be honest, I lose most of it within, you know, a relatively short time, I cannot remember it. I don't know how you guys are actually reading your books, but this is happening very commonly. I do not remember as many things as I wish I would. So that's why I started to also dig into this particular topic. And another thing that happens to me quite frequently is I forget specific key figures sometimes, and especially those that are important, but they're not mentioned quite a lot. So Things that are not often repeated, right? Like if, I mean, the 70 million monthly active users that we have every month, uh, that stuff I can remember relatively easy, right? So for me, this is not really a big problem. Um, but there are things that are important about our work that we really do not want to forget. And information that is not remembered and not documented cannot be found anymore. I know this is obvious, but I really want to mention it again. This is why we document things, especially stuff that is not mentioned all the time. I know what the revenue is of the company. I know what the monthly active users are. But do I really remember what the percentages of the customers who are using a very specific feature? I better remember. So how do we combat this? When we're thinking about cognition and memory. So let's go to the start. So I made another really cool uh, flow chart here. The very first start is the sensory memory. Things are coming in. And they're staying there for about half a second. I either see, smell, whatever, right? So through all my senses, I'm actually experiencing them. And then through attention, my brain decides what is actually relevant. And that stuff lands in the working memory. And you can retain stuff in the working memory, depending on which model that you're looking at, between 15 to 30 seconds. And then it's lost. And the way that we remember things for longer is by putting them into long-term memory. And this is called encoding. And everything that we put in here, we consider long-term memory everything that lasts beyond 30 seconds. Because usually when you can actually recall something after 30 seconds, that means you can also probably recall it after an hour or something. So the process from bringing long-term stuff from the long-term memory into the working memory is called retrieval. And the interesting part about moving stuff from working memory to long-term memory is that this encoding only happens if it's difficult. So only things that engage you 
that interest you, that are new to you, that are actually difficult for you, you can actually put into the long-term memory. Think about it. If you know about a specific concept already, then you probably don't, you don't have to learn it anymore, right? So like if I'm playing a specific music instrument, only the things that are really difficult are actually going into my long-term memory. And this is a very interesting thing because sometimes we get frustrated if we have trouble reading or like uh, or understanding something, but these are the things that are usually also sticking with us. So let's go to a practical system here. Um, this is something that I struggled with personally quite a lot, right? I read all these amazing books, like I've read about 10 or 15 of them in the last year. And I just hated how much of the important things that are in there, I just constantly forgot. So what I was doing is I was signing up to a service called um, ICS or something like I can study whatever, like it's a, um, it, it's a guy who is leading this for, 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 for student uh, university um, students and, and also professionals. And he's basing everything on the most recent research models when it comes to how cognition and memory works. So what I'm about to show you here is something that I actually extracted from this because I find it absolutely awesome. So this is called a SIR system. Um, it's not so much of a system of like things on how you should do them, but more like rules. So these are three rules or factors. So they're not techniques that positively contribute to how well you retain information and how well you are able to recall them. The first one is spacing. I will explain them in a second. The second one is interleaving. Nobody knows this word. I didn't know it either. And the third one is about retrieval. So let's go into these three. And if you do those the right way, then you have a very high chance of actually achieving long-term memory generation, which allows you to also recall it easier into the working memory and so forth. That's as far as the good stuff goes, because this is quite scary. So the search system starts with the S. This is about spacing. The spacing is how often and when you recall information. The following information that I'm going to post here is not exact. It's just a principle and you will, I think you will understand in a second, right? So first, let's say I take notes about anything and something that I really want to recall. For instance, the five things about why brainstorming is bad, right? I do not want to forget these facts. I'm going to recall the same stuff in a Notion page or in a Word document or whatever at the same, in the same day. And then I do it again after two days. Now, this is not something that takes a lot of time. It's like a 10 minute thing, right? But after two days, I'm going to revisit it again. Then I'm going to go to five to 10 days and do it again. And then after 10 to 20 days, and then after one or two months. And then you can be pretty certain that you are having a quite high chance. This is the first factor. That's a very good way of actually ensuring that you will remember what you had there. Now, I'm not saying that everything that you know down, you have to sort of repeat yourself like for five or six times or whatever. This is not really sustainable, but there are certain things that we really do not want to forget. And I can guarantee you by doing it this way, and there's two more factors coming, um, I'm able to retain much, much more. So the second one is interleaving, the word that nobody understands. This is looking at things from different angles and forms. So this could be you take the entire information that you had. So for instance, again, like why is brainstorming bad? And I teach it to an imaginary student in my car, right? So I'm imagining like this person is next to me and I'm going to teach it to them, right? I'm going to tell them just the way that I'm telling you right now. This is helping me to remember. Or you draw a mind map, you know, like you draw it up and, you know, like, okay, this is social loafing, whatever. You draw an image of it. And I did that. And I can show you how this actually looked because I actually did it for why brainstorming is bad, right? These five factors, social loathing, downward production, and so forth. This is the slide, right? This is the stuff that I wrote down at some point. And then I actually wrote it down in my notebook. This is how my notebook looks, right? This is from a book called Continuous Discovery Habits. And she's talking about these things, right? So these are the five factors, social loafing, production, and so forth. So what I did with interleaving is I actually rewrote the page, but with pictures. This forced me to think about how do these words actually look like in pictures, right? So I don't know whether any of this makes sense to you. As you can see, I'm also an amazing artist. Um, 
but this really helped me to sort of look at the things from a different perspective. And if you're doing this, you're also increasing your chance of forming a long-term memory. And this is called interleaving, right? You're looking at things from a different perspective, either audiovisually or like you're doing it as, a, as an image or you're teaching it to someone else. And the third part is how you retrieve this information. So when you're trying to remember something, don't just look at your notes beforehand. You're not just bringing up your notes and then you're just reading them again. Try to recall things from memory before you actually consult the actual written notes. If you're doing these three things and you try to re relieve them, uh, sorry, you try to retrieve them fully and not partially, then you have a pretty big chance that you will never forget whatever you just learned. Now, interestingly, these three things we do quite naturally in a couple of things um, that we do through our daily lives. So, for instance, if you're watching Game of Thrones, it's not my fault that the last season was bad, but like if you're watching Game of Thrones, right, you're in, in, you, you're in it, right? You're watching every week, you're watching an episode. You can recall an insane amount of information about that series, who is who, with whom they have something, right? Because we keep hearing about them. There is constant reminders of these characters. We're also seeing them in different contexts, right? So the interleaving part is also happening. Uh, are you on a horse? Are you not on a horse? Are you um, killing someone? Are you not killing someone? And so forth, right? So these informations are stored in our long-term memory so effortless because they're captivating, right? The storytelling is there, but they're also automatically being reinforced all the time because we can keep repeating the same information. And that is why it's so easy for us to, rem to remember these stupid sort of things um, about movies, for instance. So let's just go to the last sort of part of this presentation. I hope that was sort of interesting for you so far in terms of the practical things that we can do as an individual. Um, if we're talking about brainstorming again, so this is another repeat from before, but you, we, we should brainstorm individual, right? And then we should also discuss it as a group. So we come together again and then, um, yeah, I discuss that. Strong storytelling is important. We focus on problems. We try to create empathy for individual users. And having an organization which fosters innovation is usually cross-functional. So I've been talking about this in some other talks about the, um, um, uh, on that stuff. So I don't want to get too much into detail, but I still want to go a little bit into detail. So when we're talking about the culture of your company, and the information sharing that you do. It's about collaborative versus directive organizations, right? So we are trying to collaborative, like to be collaborative in an environment together. And we're not trying to tell other people what they have to do. Why? Because it makes it easier for everyone in a collaborative environment to be closer to the customer because they also care about it and they can also solve the problems that they actually um, um, are seeing. If a CEO or anyone from the executive layer is telling you how to do things without knowing the problems of the customers, you're starting to have problems, but then you're also in a directive organization. The second thing is we tend to focus on outcome versus output. And outcome versus output means I'm trying to, um, so I actually included an example. Well done, Leah. So if we're focusing on output, then we're measuring whether we did something. So we shipped something, we built a bike, we built um, a specific feature in a specific product. We did this, we did that. But this is relatively meaningless because if we focus on outcome, we want to have real impact for the customers. So let's say I'm telling a product team that you have to make a very specific group of users that we have happy. I don't care how you're doing it, but this is your goal. Then that is outcome driven. They will have a real impact and they can try to figure out, okay, what is their problem? What, why, what makes them so frustrated? What is the optimal solution? We're not telling them how to do things, right? So collaborative and outcome driven. And the next one is adaptability over efficiency. I talked about this in one of my other talks quite extensively, um, but this is about democratizing data and giving context. So everybody at small PDF, almost everybody, except maybe the gardener, right? because they don't have a laptop. Um, but almost everybody at small PDF has access to our entire data stack, the entire one. 
they, we, we, most, we know most of our uh, metrics, like how the business is doing, how much revenue we do, everything. We think it's important because we just do not know beforehand what kind of data is relevant to the people to make innovative decisions, right? We try to give people as much access as is possible. So for those who are actually investigative and want to know more, they can know more. They don't have to ask someone else. They don't have to come to me and say, hey, Leah, I want to query something. No, just do it yourself, right? And the second part is about empowering people. We need to make sure that if we democratize data and we give people context, if we put people in front of the customer, that they also have the power to implement solutions by themselves. You cannot be in a directive organization and also democratize data and giving context at the same time. This just does not work. What that does is that people recognize problems, but they feel powerless about doing something against them basically being in an abusive relationship. It's exactly the same thing. I have a talk about this. Um, it's on my LinkedIn profile. It's also linked in this, um, in, this, in this presentation. I think we can share the slides afterwards as well. There we'll go much more into detail about when we talk about adaptability over efficiency. So let's talk about a cross-functional organization. So what do I mean with a cross-functional organization? You have a couple of op options if you wanna change your organization into a more innovative environment. So if we talk about um, cross-functional organizations, what we mean is teams with people in there from different disciplines. In my team, for instance, there's me, I'm a product manager. We have designers, I have front-end engineers, I have back-end engineers, I have data analysts, and I have UX researchers. So we're pretty independent in what we're doing. And the best thing that you could do in your, in your, uh, in your organization and Unfortunately, this is not the case for everyone in this call, but like what you can do as a leader is to have independent squads. So cross-functional teams through the org throughout the organization. A cross-functional team, as I already said, is a group of people with a variety of expertise who come together to achieve a common goal. These are fancy words for just meaning a team that is independent. We're trying to eliminate dependencies. We're trying to make teams independent. So this is the best solution that you can have. So let's say you cannot do that or you're not in an organization that actually does that. The second best thing that you can do is a virtual reorganization. This is something that you layer on top of a functional organization and it's basically doing the same thing as before. You're trying to create work groups which are cross-functional but unofficial in nature. They're not reflected in your organigram. What that actually means is like I'm going to other product leaders and I'm asking them, hey, for the next three months, let's work on this particular project, right? So like we're putting ourselves together, but we're just not telling anyone like officially, right? So there's not a press announcement, there's not a change in your organigram or whatever. We're not gonna go and do a full reorganization. It's not the best thing, but it's the second best thing that you can do in this regard. The third best thing that you can do is actually called managing across. This is managing across teams by agreeing on commitment and scope of work, right? So we say, okay, my team is doing this and your team is doing that. Do you agree, right? And then the leaders are sort of with each other for the length of the project. We're already getting into a territory where it's not that fun anymore. But the fourth best solution, which is probably the last one before you just do nothing, is dividing tasks. Basically, you assign people to be liaisons into other teams, divided into different parts of work. Um, as you can imagine, like if you have a big project, you just say, okay, you're doing this, I'm doing that. Usually doesn't work, but it's better than doing, doing nothing. We all know this, right? So like if we have things that are dependent on other teams, they just take a very long time or you hear sentences like, yeah, we don't have time in the sprint. We're gonna do it next time. It's a very typical thing in cross-functional organizations. So again, to repeat squads first, then virtual reorganization, then managing across and then dividing tasks. So now to the most interesting topic, at least for me, I think, um, which is product-led versus sales-led. If you want to do the ultimate thing, right, and you have a company or a startup or like you're, you're, you're thinking about changing how you actually develop products, then you should have heard about product-led versus sales-led. Now, the traditional model of selling something to a customer is to take a buyer from point A to point B in a sales cycle. We all know this. I would like to um, call you about this particular software that I need. Yes, one of our sales representatives is calling you back and so forth, right? This is a sales-led model. It's very, very common in B2B. 
a product-led model, which is relatively new, comparatively speaking, is here, use the product, and we help you get a meaningful outcome while using it. If you want, you can upgrade. So in other words, what we do is we are driving user acquisition, expansion, conversion, and retention are all driven by the product. We're focusing on the user and what they get out of it. And the product is the source of sustainable, scalable business growth. Now, if you think, yeah, but every sales organization does that too, uh -uh, they're not doing that. What they do is they hear from sales what the customer wants, and then you're building custom solutions to try to sort of go into the market. And then the salespeople are also trying to convince the users to buy. What we're doing in a product lend model is we're trying to focus on reducing the friction as much as is possible for the user to experience the product before they make a buying decision. This is very often the case for SaaS models, you know, like software as a service models, where you can actually try something out before you buy it, right? Product-led model, pretty simple. Here's an interesting fact, though. Product-led does not mean that you do not have a sales department. 96% of all product-led companies have a sales department, and I will show you why in a second. There are three things that we take care of when we're talking about a product-led um, environment. We're designing for the end user. So we're putting the needs of real people first, we're listening to their problems, and we're committing to make consistent improvements to our products, consistent and constantly. We deliver value before we're capturing value. Now, this is a very important one. For self-serve products, we keep them simple. So if you go on a website and you're trying a specific product, it's important that the product is simple, that you can experience it. That is the main value that you have, right? It's easy to learn. It's easy to get some out, something out of it. This is what we call for self-serving products. For human touch point products, where you have to get in touch with a human person beforehand, the customer success always become for sales. We're still trying to show the customer some form of success before we tell them how much it costs and that they have to sort of sign here. And then, you know, we're not trying to convince people to buy our product. We're trying to tell them and find whether we have a good fit for them. And that is a completely different approach. We're investing in the product with a final intent for a couple of things. The first one is the product data to allow tracking and measuring. Product-led companies are traditionally extremely data heavy. We know very, very quick whether our customers are unhappy because we're gathering NPS. We also know from the usage statistics whether something is wrong. We know this very, very quick, right? So the first iteration, even like if you have a product-led model, you have to make sure that from day one, you are tracking your stuff and you're tracking it solid. And then also the analysis that comes from it, of course. We're focusing on growth and distribution. What that means is, if you're thinking about a successful product, what a successful product is, is first of all, you need to have a kick-ass solution to a very specific problem. Sure, but you also need to have a distribution model that actually allows you to reach these customers. And because the product-led organization is so good in producing a very good product, we also need this the other side, and that is one team that focuses on bringing us out into the world. That can be through SEO, that can be through networking effects. If you think about um, Instagram or some other products where you can also invite other people, you can share your, your accounts and then you can see, oh, okay, this is really cool. I also want to have something like this. This is a good example. So you have a team that is responsible for growth. It's not a sales team. It's just responsible for growth. And here's an important thing. Typically in product-led organizations, you do not see big redesigns. It's very rare that you have a huge change of the product, you know, like version two is coming out, boom, 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 boom. Why? Because the development is focused on incremental improvements. So we are trying to figure out with smaller innovative ideas that we can test because we're also tracking everything, whether they have a real impact with the customer. If you imagine, we have 70 million monthly active users. I have so many users that I can test with. If we are launching something relatively new, we can see whether people are actually reacting positively to it. Do they subscribe to us more? Do they actually create more accounts? Do they give us good ratings? That kind of stuff. And if it doesn't, then we cannot ship it or we have to improve on it. And this is why product-led organizations have incremental improvements and not these big redesigns that you see often from um, enterprises. 
you know, like, oh, here's the next version of our product. It's totally amazing. So the user acquisition, expansion, conversion, retention are all driven by the product, as I already said. And the product is the source of the sustainable, scalable business growth. I think I just have duplicated this slide. I'm not 100% sure. Yes, this is a duplicate. There we go. This is the slide that I wanted to see. So if you're thinking about the go-to market in sales-led versus product-led, you do not need to understand this entire thing. The important thing is this. SQL stands for sales qualified leads. In a normal, traditional flow, you are being hit relatively early by sales. I need to speak to a sales representative because I want to buy this piece of hardware or whatever. And what that means is that you have a lot of people now in your pipeline who are not very interested because they have not really experienced the product. And therefore, you have to finance for all these lost leads. The successful ones have to pay for all the other salespeople, you know, like who have worked on the entire pipeline and so forth. Why I mentioned before the 96% of all product led businesses still have a sales department is imagine you have a product like ours and you notice that some users are actually using the product very, very heavily. Now, if we start to contact those, the onset is completely different. This is what we mean here, right? So there's product usage, and then there's a sales interest, and then sales is starting to contact people who have already engaged with the product. They already know that it is good, so they're ready for an upsell or like, okay, hey, can we also help you with something else, and so forth. The way that you can convert these people actually into your product is now completely different. And this is also why you need still a sales product, a sales department. So having said that, that is the end of my presentation. I hope it was not too chaotic and I hope it was um, kind of practical in the same sense at the same time. We're still, we're hiring. This is my LinkedIn. Um, we have careers. And our career page is smallpdf.com slash jobs. So we're hiring in product management, engineers, business, UX design. We're hiring everyone. I mean, not everyone, but like for everything. And um, yeah, that is my last slide. And I think we have some questions. Eva, if you want to take over. Yeah. I, need, I yeah. need to take a, a sip of water. Um, yeah, I'll take over from here. Thank you, Leah. It was really inspiring. And after all those years of education, actually, uh, this is the first time that somebody taught me how to learn. So. <laughs> I think it was really fun. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. We have some questions uh, that came before the event from LinkedIn uh, registration form. I will address those. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in chat or you can use Q&A tool here in Google Meet. So the first question is from Maya from LinkedIn. And she uh, asked us how to incorporate time needed for innovation with the daily business. I always get a bit curious when teams invest a week in innovation sprint, but they don't do it continuously. Also, is there something like innovation-led products? Um, I think, yeah, well, okay. I mean, basically what I just said, my entire presentation. So an innovation-led product is essentially an organization that also fosters this all the time. I feel like sometimes companies um, try to put uh, these, these, um, how do you say that in English? You know, like you put a tape on a on a on a cut or something sometimes um, to deal with a bigger problem, you know. And then they have these innovation sprints. Now, innovation sprints are there's nothing wrong with that if you try to ideate on a really big problem and then you try to find solutions. But I think the underlying truth when it comes to innovation is you need to have an organization that fosters this. If you are not working close to the customer. This is super difficult. It doesn't matter how well you learn or how good your storytelling is. You need to somehow get to the customer, right? So like if the organization doesn't allow you to do that, or if somebody else tells you how to do your job, it's maybe time to actually change your job. So to address her question, um, continuous innovation is difficult, but you need product managers and leaders who are aligning you, aligning you constantly on the customer. And I think this is the main part of my job and also what we do as sort of as product managers is to stay close with the problems. It is my job to actually force the customer in front of my um, people so they have to listen to them. And I think through all the user interviews that we're doing, the things that I remember even after years are those customer interviews where people got emotional. I lost my documents. 
I have this particular contract. We had a guy from Mexico telling us for like 15 minutes what, what kind of contracts that he had on his house mortgage and stuff. And he showed us all of them. We could not really stop him. He was so in the topic and it was so frustrating for him to actually deal with these documents. I still remember this. And the fact that I still remember this is also increasing the chance that if we are doing some sort of ideation in the future, that we're also dealing with some parts of these problems, right? So I would say, yeah, an innovation-led product, stay close to the customer and keep the emotions really close to, to what we have because this is how we understand the world. I know this is a cop-out answer, but it's a pretty good answer, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, another question from Amer. Um, highest paid person uh, opinion, setting arbitrary deadlines and not allowing enough time for discovery. Um, okay, so... <laughs> So the question is hippos setting arbitrary deadlines okay um yeah well okay i already said that you should be in a collaborative environment versus a directive one i mean this is another factor that makes it just very very hard however there is some leeway that you can actually have <clears throat> i think some people that i coach <clears throat> are actually also in this call <clears throat> and they heard the story already um so if you're trying to combat from an executive level what is coming down into your product development, and what I mean with that is like the CEO coming to your desk and says, hey, I heard about this particularly cool thing. We should build this. Then you have two problems. First of all, if there is no process of evaluation, like trying to figure out, okay, cool idea, but here's how we're doing, how we're dealing with this. So how many people does this affect? How can we actually build a solution for this? Is there a market for it? That's the first part, right? So you, you sort of have to size the opportunity first. But then the other thing is, if you're a good product manager and good product leader, then you're going to go and say, if we're doing this, we're not going to do this, and we're not going to do this, and we're not going to do this. Because addressing innovative ideas or good opportunities is not just about whether you can do them or how much time they actually take. It's about from all the things that we can do during this day. And we all do this every day. We have to decide what kind of things that we want to do. There's always an opportunity because there's always more to do than we can actually do. So I think in a way you have to get to the point where you can formalize these ideas and say why they're bad or why they're good. But just like saying, oh no, I don't think this is a good idea is probably bad. But the uh, hippos are real. Um, I think I call them dinosaurs or whatever like you know like in these typical enterprises um yeah it's it's not good but like you should try to actually level ideas out in terms of like which one makes the most sense to build at this point in regards to what we can do and if you cannot convince them then you again i'm going to answer to all of these questions like just change your job <laughs> okay then uh, I will try not to skip anything. Uh, Daniel <laughs> Kunz asks question, assuming that finding the next big thing requires a unique insight from either customer, users, go-to-market, or tech. One challenge I see is having the team understand the value of spending time on product discovery. I'll what say this. Um, if you manage once to enable a team to go through this entire process by themselves. And this is very important. It's not that, oh, I have an idea and you guys are doing it, right? They need to come up with the ideas themselves. That means from customer problem up to the solution, up to the uh, implementation, up to the experiment where we say, okay, this is working or this is not working. Um, that's where the learning starts to set in. And then they also start to do it by themselves. Because let's be honest, we're not doing these things for fun. We're doing them because they work. Right? We're measuring things because we know that this is the way to actually go forward with things. I know it's not always fun to actually look at all these metrics and so forth, but the first moment where you actually do have a successful experiment, this is where these things are starting to self um, sort of perpetuate. And as I said, there is nothing that beats the experience of seeing your actual customer using your product and losing their shit, right? Like there's, they're so frustrated or they're so happy about something or they're so excited or just so annoyed there this is these are real experiences that stay with people and everybody remembers those whether you're feeling for the customer or whether you think they're stupid that is your choice right but like an innovative team is trying to always solve and address the problem why did this now happen and um yeah 
again, close to the customer. And if it doesn't work, change your job. <laughs> okay, I see the pattern here. <laughs> Uh, we have one question here in chat from Sven. Uh, he thanks you. He said, uh, I could take very much out of this webinar. I've got a question regarding creativity is measurable. I understand how to measure the fluency, but how do I measure the others? So measuring in the sense of like putting a number to it will be quite difficult. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, it's not so much about measuring like in numbers or in practical numbers, but it's just important to understand that if you say, how well am I in elaborating my ideas? You can still sort of measure this. And you can measure this by having a very open feedback loop towards the people um, telling you back your own ideas. So for instance, let's say you have an idea in your head and you explain it to someone, and then you ask this person to explain you the idea back. If what you're getting back is completely different than what you said, then you didn't elaborate it very well. So there are ways, right? So, and then you can also do this exercise actually as a method to increase your elaboration. Like you can say, hey, there's a, there's a, specific, uh, there's a specific technique in uh, interviewing where you repeat back the question to the person who actually asked you something, right? So we do this in recruiting or we do this in, uh, in user research as well. This is to make sure that we understood the question correct. This method itself can also make sure that everybody understands what you mean. Um, a practical example would be if you're uh, collaborating in a Miro environment or whatever, and you're you're writing down an idea, make sure that everybody understands what you mean. You and me can talk about God and the world, but maybe I understand something else under God what you understand, right? So that's a very good example. So clarifying and going through this time of making sure that we mean the same thing is a quite important thing. That's the first one on elaboration. The other things... Um, I would say you can never measure how original your idea is, but you can tell whether something is original or whether it's not original, right? I mean, that you can at least tell. So I don't think it's about measuring like an active uh, number, um, but it's more to understand, okay, there are these four factors and you can influence them positively in the end. And other than that, you just change your job. <laughs> okay, I was waiting for that. Sorry, Sven. Uh, <laughs> uh, question from Bob. Uh, what are the best ways to measure the impact of your new creative implementation? Oh, that's a simple one. Well, if you sell more products in a product-led organization, that is pretty easy to measure. Um, if you have impact with your customers, you will see it in the metrics relatively fast. You will sell more, um, you will drive engagement and so forth and so forth. Something will happen somewhere. And um, yeah, so for product-led organizations, this is relatively easy. If you see engagement go up, that's exactly how you should measure it. You should know, how, know, know beforehand what actually your solution does. Is it increasing retention? Is it, is it just driving like the acquisition? Are people more signing up and so forth? This is important. Yeah, but that's how we measure it. Yeah. Okay, and he also uh, asked us, what is the best way to verify if your idea has the potential to succeed? Um, that's a good question. So this depends on how difficult something is to develop. So the bigger the idea is to develop, the harder it is to develop something, it might be worth it to invest more research into it. The most basic way to know whether you can actually succeed with your idea um, is to ask people. And you don't need to ask that many people, right? So let's say, I don't know, you want to open an ice cream stand in front of your house. Go out on a sunny day, try to figure out how many people are actually passing by that have an interest in actually buying ice cream. And then you're trying to find out how many sunny days you actually have in your uh, area at the same time, right? So it depends on how big the idea is and uh, how much research that you actually want to invest in it. But the most basic version is to ask 10 people from a very specific customer group whether they have a specific problem. And if they do, then we can try to put an MVP out to see whether it actually has some pull. Yeah. Okay. No punchline here. <laughs> uh, we have a question from Simona. How to prioritize UX when it isn't a revenue-driven initiative? Oh, perfect. Well, if it's not a revenue-driven <laughs> initiative, um, well, that actually means that you can prioritize. I mean, UX in the end is a tool to make the tool easier to understand and use. This is sometimes a difficult answer in a B2B product or where you do not have that many users. So you need to do qualitative testing, like you need to run your product through like five or six people to figure out whether there's an effect or something. Um, 
but everything that you do should have some effect somewhere. If you're just doing a rebranding exercise, um, I don't know, that, sh that still should have an impact. And an impact in the end is also converting into revenue, right? So like, for instance, we know in our company, the more documents that somebody is processing, the more revenue this will create because we know the people who are processing more documents are more likely to actually create an account with us. So this is the difference between value capture and value creation metrics. So value creation is really creating value for the user. And this stuff is actually turning into um, money in the end um, on a long term. So if your UX improvements do not drive a lot of value or not enough, then you don't need them. This is the stupid question or like the stupid answer to this problem that I would say. Um, but if it has an impact, then you should do it. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from Amancio, how to make your people and customers excited and enjoy the process of innov innovating rather than letting them wait for the judgment of others? How do you make your people excited? So, yeah, I think sort of same answer as before. Your own people are excited about innovation if they see the reaction of people of using something. Like the more new that something is and you do actually create it, the more proud you are of actually doing specific things, right? Like I'm, I'm pretty proud of the things that we actually did in our team. Um, I am, you know, like from research to design and everything that we have. This excitement is pretty easy to create, I think, because again, you're dealing with emotions. Just don't stand too far away from the customer. So that's the boring answer. How do you make your customers excited? Um, I don't know, have kick-ass solutions, like really solve something. And that's making them excited, I guess. Um, other than that, I'm not 100% sure. Wait, he also wrote a reasoning. Um, uh -huh. Okay, so if it's about also making others excited about what you are building inside the company, I mean, I don't know. The answer is the same, right? So you're, you're having sometimes big bets. And sometimes these big bets, they don't really succeed. Like, let's say we have a couple of big initiatives but we already think like there's a 20% chance that one of them is sort of going through. You don't have to make people excited about it as long as it's your own team. That That is sort of, that is normally enough, right? So we have the chance to actually try things. You, you can create conviction by better research. If I find enough people who want to buy an ice cream, then the, the, my willingness to give you the money for the ice cream stand is probably higher, right? So the answer to this is probably data substantiation. If you can show what other people have done, other companies have done in the area, or that there is a big group of people who are just waiting for this particular solution, then you have already quite some data substantiation to actually bring this thing through. Another boring answer for myself, but yeah, I think I think that's, that's fair, yeah. Well, it's a good answer. And finally, we have some final thought from Dr. Dennis Kohlberg from LinkedIn. Uh, he told us accepting and convincing others to accept that innovation does not come from one single genius mastermind, but rather many talks uh, to colleagues and users, as well as iterating, finding proof and throwing away a lot of other ideas, although you even love them more. Uh, and he wants to hear your thoughts on it. Um, yeah, I agree 100%. I think, again, on what the job of a product manager is, we have shifted from superstars where it was accept it, it was kind of expected that we always have the best ideas. They were the smartest people in the room. And I think the job has changed to exactly what he just mentioned. We are becoming gardeners. I do not expect to have the best ideas in my team. This is not about me succeeding. This is about the team succeeding. I do not care where an idea is coming from, whether it's from my CEO or whether it's from my intern. They all get the same treatment. And if something is good, we're gonna go through with it. Sure, people who are working closer to the customers like me also have a higher likelihood of finding something specifically that we can address, but it doesn't matter where an idea is actually coming from. So I would say, um, I think I used the phrase from superhero to gardener, right? So like we're more the gardeners and the people that we have are kind of plants. <laughs> Sounds a bit weird, but yeah, I think I think that's a good summary. Yeah, I think we will take a lot of metaphors from this webinar today. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not. Yeah, I'm not sure it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's it. Uh, that's it when it comes to questions. If uh, you have some more, uh, maybe you can uh, ask them in chat. But I can see that we're out of questions. 
So thank you, Leah. This was really fun. Thank you. I hope that uh, you learned something new that you find uh, that you found a way to how to innovate and how, how to learn. <laughs> Maybe because I know I have, and I'm sure you have. So as we already mentioned, Leah mentioned it, and I also small PDF is growing, and we are hiring uh, product people, engineers, and uh, she also shared uh, some uh, links in her presentation that you will also get. So uh, maybe uh, if you uh, decide to join our team, you will get the chance to work with Leah and learn from her every day. Uh, thank every you so day. much. Uh, you can uh, check out some position on our website or you can reach out to Leah or me uh, through LinkedIn or uh, any other ways. So thank you so much for listening once again and enjoy the rest of your evening. And Leah, thanks again. Thank you all for joining. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.